America is quietly in the midst of the worst drug, drug epidemic in the history of the country. Tonight we bring you the first installment of a week-long series called Drugged, looking at the story of America's opioid crisis. Slightly more than half a million Americans live in Montgomery County, Ohio, a place most famous for being home to the Wright brothers, inventors of modern flight. But it was there earlier this year that the coroner's office was forced to lease space at a nearby funeral parlor. It didn't have room for the growing number of corpses killed by opioids. 160 miles away in Huntington, West Virginia, a much smaller town, 28 overdose patients arrived at local hospitals in just four hours. Those are just two examples of what constitute the worst drug epidemic in American history. The surge is fueled by opioid abuse. Opioids are pain-killing drugs which depress the central nervous system and are profoundly physically addictive. Some, like oxycodone and morphine, can be legally prescribed by doctors and are. Others, like heroin, are banned by law. In 2015, opioids accounted for nearly two-thirds of the 52,000 Americans killed by drug overdoses. Every day, they take the lives of 91 more Americans. That's about twice the number of Americans killed per day at the height of the war in Vietnam. A big part of the problem is availability. In 12 states, mostly across the Midwest and the South, the number of opioid painkiller prescriptions exceeds the number of residents who live there. In New Hampshire, for example, a state of 1.3 million people, 13 million doses of opioids were dispensed within a single three-month period. In West Virginia, meanwhile, the opioid overdose rate is more than 40 per 100,000 people. To put that in perspective, that's more than 20 times worse than the peak of the crack cocaine epidemic. The crisis is an American problem. Americans consumed 81% of the global supply of oxycodone and almost 100% of the supply of hydrocodone, those are the active ingredients in some of the most popular prescription painkillers. Once hooked, addicts looking for a better or cheaper high overwhelmingly turned to the black market. Four out of five heroin users started with prescription painkillers. As the number of prescription painkillers rises, it should come as no surprise that the popularity of heroin rises too, and it does. That's why since 2002, the number of heroin addicts in the U.S. has increased by 500%. All of which brings us back to Montgomery County, Ohio. That county's biggest city, Dayton, ranks number one in the country for drug ODs and is widely considered the heroin capital of America. In the state of Ohio, 3,310 people died of accidental drug overdoses in 2015 alone. That's more than the number of people killed on 9-11. Christopher Caldwell is a senior editor at the Weekly Standard. He's author of what I think is the single best overview of the opioid crisis yet written. It's called American Carnage, and it's on our Facebook page. Please go to that. Uh, he joins us now in the studio. Chris, great to see you. Great to see you, too, Tucker. So what are the factors that led to this crisis? Well, you know, uh, a lot recently, but, but more remotely. Um, you know, the United States has had a very, very fraught relationship with um, pain relievers, which I think has to do with the way a few things came together in the 19th century. Around the same time, you had the isolation of morphine, right. which is, comes from an opium poppy. It's the great opioid, morphine. You had the invention of the hypodermic needle, and you had the Civil War. And um, I think a lot of people came back from the Civil War addicted, and, 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 and doctors became very enthusiastic about the pain-killing properties of this drug and so they started to prescribe it kind of promiscuously and by the first world war the united states had a big problem with it and voted to ban it and 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 there was a real taboo about opioids and that changed we had a problem in the late 60s and 70s soldiers coming back from vietnam addicted mm -hmm. to this stuff but the crisis now dwarfs that and part of the reason is you write in this fantastic piece is that our attitudes about pain relief changed and that was in part the result of lobbying. I think that's right. I mean, um, uh, there, there, there was a problem with, with drugs in the 1960s. There, there, there was a great popularity of them. But heroin was not really part of it. Hippies didn't do heroin. There was this specific problem in Vietnam, but, but that was very confined and it was a very right. localized thing. It was in the 90s that um, a number of corporations began lobbying and, um, and, and actually spending a lot of money on PR for a more liberal uh, attitude towards pain relief, treating 
the relief of pain as a, as a kind of a, a human right. And also talking about pain as a kind of a, a fifth vital sign, I think is what they, what they called it. And in 1996, um, Purdue Pharmaceuticals brought out um, OxyContin, which was a, it was a special way of delivering the opioid oxycodone. Uh, it would deliver it time release, so you could pack a lot into a pill, but because it entered the system slowly, it was thought not to be so dangerous. But addicts would, um, you know, they'd crush them or they'd um, bite them, and, and you could release the whole thing at the same time and get high. Um, and on top of that, these things tended to be wildly overprescribed. I mean, um, wildly overprescribed. Yeah, yes, yes. But here's what I don't understand: so this, the, opioids are physically addictive. The more that reach a community, the higher the addiction rate. I mean, it's, it's, there's a pretty clear relationship here. Why has the federal government, which oversees this through the FDA, not shut it down? Well, I don't know how you shut it down. You know, I mean, you, you, do you mean to sort of to ban? Um, to ban opioids, to stop well, using or them to pain ban pain? the promiscuous prescription of them yeah, I, in ways that are clearly detrimental to right. the society. That that has tended to be a state responsibility, and I think the states are really beginning to do it. And, and and certainly some of the states that I visited for this article, like Rhode Island and Maine, now have, in their very different ways, um, um, pretty serious regimes for sort of cracking down on the over prescription of these. What things. happened at Purdue Pharma? Did it make any money on this? I believe they made a good deal of money on it. I think the, 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 the Sackler family, um, which owns Purdue Pharma, is on the, I think it's their number 16 on the list of the Forbes richest families. Uh, Just yes. from selling Oxycontin? I believe Oxy, the, the lion's share of their businesses, of, of Purdue Pharma's businesses in Oxycontin, yeah. If we're, we've got 30 seconds left, if you were to do one thing to stop this, not to treat the people currently addicted, but to prevent more people from becoming addicted, mm -hmm. what would it be? I think that there is a big problem with fentanyl, which is an artificial opioid uh, yes. that can be made in the lab, coming in from both China and Mexico. I think that things can be done to interdict it. And that is the deadliest of all the opioids and derivatives? Well, it's about 50 times as strong as normal heroin. Um, and, and dealers like to cut it by a factor of 50, right. so it's normal, but, but they don't always do a good job, and so it's highly unpredictable, and it leads to a lot of overdoses. I can tell. Christopher Caldwell, the piece is American mm -hmm. Carnage. It's on our Facebook page. Thanks a lot for joining us. Thank you.